Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. If you've been following along with the channel for any length of time, you'll know that graphics cards and graphics architectures are one of my biggest loves. And this actually stems from the 90s when I was following along with what was happening with the voodoo cards and matrox and all of that stuff. I just found it absolutely fascinating to see every leap forward. Not to mention the fact that back then I really wanted SLI Voodoo 2, so I actually never got them. I only had a single card, then I moved to Voodoo 3. But anyway, let's get back onto the topic. RDNA 3 and Lovelace are shaping up to be absolutely ridiculous. In fact, there have been some leaks with Lovelace, which says that we're going to be seeing over 70% CUDA cores over what we have with the RTX 30 series. If you're unfamiliar with Lovelace, it is said to be an interim GPU because Hopper, which is an MCM GPU from NVIDIA, is said to be delayed. So Lovelace is going to be built on the 5NM processor, and as I've covered a couple of times now on the channel, it doesn't seem that Lovelace is just a simple refresh of Ampere. There are some fundamental architectural differences, but we have 3D Center as well as Copa T7 Kimi that have been putting out some tweaks as they tend to do. And it seems that, yes, essentially we're seeing almost double the number of graphics clusters on um, Lovelace. And that means a ridiculous number of additional CUDA cores. You can see both of their tweets on the screen right now. But the nutshell is that uh, Ampere's GA102 die, that is fully kitted out with everything enabled, has seven graphics uh, processing clusters, or GPC if you prefer, which equals to 10,752 CUDA cores. Again, that is the fully maxed out GPU. Whereas Lovelace AD102 would feature 12 graphics processing clusters and <laughs> just, just an absolutely ridiculous 18,432 FP32 CUDA cores. So assuming the clock frequency of this GPU is just 1.8 gigahertz, we're looking at 66 teflops of performance, but obviously this GPU is going to be running much faster than that, which is going to be easily over 70 teflops of FP32, or full precision floating point performance, which again is absolutely just mind-blowing. I think it's fair to say that we're going to be seeing this architecture on GDDR6X. I don't think GDDR7 is going to be available by the time this architecture comes out, which does lead us some, to some interesting questions concerning the memory configuration. It is possible they would go with yet a wider bus. However, um, I don't think they would want to go much more than 320 or 384 bit because then you start running into a whole litany of problems. The first is, well, memory is kind of expensive and you've also got additional complexity on the die and the PCB and also additional power consumption and just goodness knows what else. It can be nice for product segmentation, but generally speaking, I don't think they're gonna do something insane like add in 512-bit memory bus. I mean, yes, uh, this is not unheard of for graphics architectures, but I don't think it's very likely here. This is not a leak, but this is my guess. I think that there's a very good likelihood we will see some type of larger cache on Lovelace. As a guess, I think that um, NVIDIA will likely go with the same routes as we've seen with AMD. Now, whether it's going to be such a large quantity of cache as what we've seen uh, with AMD and the Infinity cache, which is obviously 128 megabytes for, let's say, the 6800 XT, I don't know. I probably would be skeptical it would be so large, but obviously I'm not, you know, peering over the shoulders of uh, NVIDIA's engineers, so it is possible that they would do that. However, a larger cache makes sense for a lot of reasons. The first is that you don't need as much memory bandwidth as we've seen, but it also has other uh, interesting imp uh, implications as well, not least of which it reduces the power consumption. This is one of the reasons, not certainly the only reason, but one of the reasons that RDNA 2 is more power efficient than what we saw with RDNA 1. So I, I think we can probably make a few guesses to the direction that NVIDIA will go. I suspect it's still going to be GDDR6X memory. I suspect there's going to be a larger amount of cache. And 
because it's NVIDIA, I would be shocked if ray tracing performance wasn't considerably faster. Then again, you can make a very compelling argument that they don't really need to do a whole lot to the ray tracing cores, at least in theory. I mean, even if there was a modest, a small increase in the performance of the RT core versus what we see with Ampere, you would just have so many more of them, theoretically, that it may just help balance itself out. Uh, and furthermore, you would also guess, based upon the 5NM process of Samsung, that the clock frequency would also be a bit faster. Now, I personally think that NVIDIA would double down and improve the ray tracing performance on the RT cores, but either way, the bottom line is, Lovelace is going to be absolutely ridiculous when it launches. Now, the question is, when it launches? So RTX 30 obviously just recently launched, but that was about two years after we saw Turing, and Turing was about two years after we saw Pascal and so on. So my guess is that uh, we're not going to be seeing Lovelace launch tomorrow. I think that it's going to be either late next year at best, or more likely it could even be 2022. Then again, it, all, it really does depend on what pressures they feel that AMD will be bringing uh, to the table, and also the release schedule of RDNA 3. Papa Jansen is not a man who likes to be on the back foot. And we've kind of seen this already with um, what I've been reporting with the RTX 3080 Ti, which is basically an RTX 3090, albeit with a slightly narrower memory bus, and also even the RTX 3070 Ti as well. So my guess is that Jansen is going to want to keep on top as much as possible, especially because Lisa and her team at the moment are really just going absolutely ballistic with memory. RDNA 2 just scales so well depending on where it's placed. So obviously you can have a really powerful desktop GPU like the 6800, for example, or you can have a, a laptop GPU, which is still discreet, but you could cut down the amount of memory or do whatever else. And we can kind of imagine what will happen with um, APUs featuring RDNA 2, especially when uh, we consider also DDR5, which is naturally going to boost the amount of memory bandwidth available. APUs currently are kind of limited simply because of DDR4 and the fact that they don't have like the cache structure as what you could associate with RDNA 2. So imagine a decent amount of cache on board, DDR5 and RDNA 2 is going to be rocking. But there are still a lot of weaknesses with RDNA 2. Uh, the most obvious at the moment is ray tracing performance. I know that not everyone is on the choo-choo ray tracing hype train. Personally, I am. But it's hard to imagine in a couple of years' time, AMD are not going to fix this problem. Um, I guess it depends on if you consider it a problem. I think that ray tracing is going to continue to be really pushed heavily. I don't think we're going to see a full path trace future anytime soon, but ray tracing is going to start to become very much normal, especially with AAA games now on consoles. I don't think it's going to be in every single thing. I don't think we're going to see full ray traced everything in games, but I think smart usage of ray tracing is going to be incredibly important. So my guess is that RDNA 3 is going to really improve on that. We're going to see um, even higher uh, numbers of um, uh, compute units shoved onto the GPU. Uh, probably better geometry performance, and just overall, I think that uh, the next couple of years are going to be extremely competitive in graphics technology. I am super hyped to see more about more information about Lovelace. Um, it's kind of weird because as fast as these modern GPUs are, just for example, RTX 3080 or 6800 XT, and those GPUs are fast. But still, some games are so demanding, and this is why technology like DLSS or when AMD releases their super resolution technology, I think it's going to be so important. So definitely stick with us here at Red Gaming Tech if you want more on that. Finally, I would like to discuss Rocket Lake. Now, I know some of you are not exactly super hyped about Rocket Lake, and believe me, I do get the negatives of Rocket Lake. The power consumption is not exactly looking to be stellar, but this chip, if you do want gaming performance or single thread performance, 
I have to say this chip is looking really impressive. And it does also make me wonder what Intel can do when they finally move off of this damn 14nm process. So there have been leaked benchmarks for Rocket Lake. Well, actually, there's a couple of leaked benchmarks. We'll go into them in just a moment. And to say that they are impressive is a huge understatement. They absolutely annihilate Intel's previous flagship, the 10900K. But more interesting, at least in my opinion, is that they're actually defeating the Zen 3 based chips from AMD in single thread performance when it comes to the 5950X and they are actually destroying the 5800X. Now the reason I find that so interesting is, well a couple of reasons. One, it's going to bring competition back hopefully to um, the kind of the 8 core chips which I think that the 5800X is an amazing processor, please don't get me wrong, and what AMD have accomplished on the amount of power that the chip is sipping is amazingly impressive. However, I still think that the chip is a little more expensive perhaps than what I would have liked to have seen it priced. However, I do understand why AMD did that. At the end of the day, those processors are just the best offering at the moment. There is, like, Intel just can't compete at this point with what Zen 3 has to offer. So why wouldn't AMD raise the price? So I'm hoping A, Rocket Lake does force AMD to reduce the price at the very least of the 5800X and possibly 5600X. But the other reason I find it interesting too is just more choice for us as customers. But anyway, let's look at this stuff. I just want to give credit to Harakazi5719 for actually bringing this to our attention as the leak was over at Billy Billy. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And we're actually seeing 11900, 11700, 11700K and a whole plethora of other chips. I'm going to very quickly go over the specs of these, although I think they're fairly well known at this point. 8 cores, 16 threads, 16 megabytes of level 3 cache. And also we have a larger amount of L2 cache per core. So rather than 256, it goes up to 512. So in this case, it's four megabytes of level two cache total. So there is a bit of confusion because the 11900K and the 11700K are basically identical orbit clock frequencies. Essentially, the 11700K just has slightly lower clock frequencies both for the all-core speed and also single-core. So the rumors are at the moment that the 900K goes to 4.8 gigahertz for all-core, whereas single-core is 5.3, which is still pretty damn impressive. And this is compared to 4.6 for all-core and 5 gigahertz. So 300 megahertz slower for single-core and uh, 200 megahertz slower for um, all-core. Although what we can get when overclocking, who the hell knows? WCCF Tech actually compi uh, compiled excuse me, these benchmarks from Harakaze as well as 3D Center into a really nice graph. So uh, full credit to them. I'll link that article in the video description. And you can see exactly what I'm talking about regarding the 11900K, the 5800X, and also the 10900K. And this is for Cinebench and CPU-Z as well as Cinebench R23. So, for example, the 11900K uh, scores in um, CPU-Z single thread 710 points. This is compared to uh, mid-600, usually around 663, 6, uh, 650, something like that, for the 5800X. Cinebench R23 scores 1700 points for single thread, whereas with the 5800 point, uh, sorry, with the 5800, it's 1600 points. And again, this also absolutely decimates the 10900K as well. Unfortunately, these are just the 11700K, so it's not quite uh, the pinnacle of what they have to offer. But single thread performance with Geekbench is 1810 for this particular sample. Uh, the 5950X for single thread is 1672, at least in this particular entry that uh, WCCF Tech are using. Whereas, obviously, multi-thread performance, the 5950X does stomp the 11700K. So, 11,300 versus 16,500. But, it is also way faster than the 5800X. It's around 1,000 points faster than 5800X. And it's also considerably faster than the 10900K. Perhaps, more importantly, 
The 11700K for the single thread performance is 1810, as I mentioned a moment ago, which is about 400 points higher than the 10900K. I think Zen 3 and um, Rocket Lake have one similarity, and that is that while they are rather large leaps over the architectures which came before them, so for example, Zen 3 is a huge leap over Zen 2, I don't think they hold a candle to what's coming next. Clearly, every generation of processor is faster than the previous one, but in this case, I think, for example, Zen 4 is going to be absolutely ridiculous. Yes, we're going to be seeing a Zen 3 refresh first, but I want to talk about Zen 4 for a moment. Imagine what we will see with DDR5 memory, for example, coming into the fray. It's really just mind-blowing to think what the next generation of processors is really going to bring to um, the mainstream. And uh, I really look forward to seeing what Intel will be doing with Alder Lake as well. I think Alder Lake is going to be a very telling architecture. I think it will be the architecture where we really know whether Intel can get back on that saddle, whether they will really be able to compete with AMD, or whether we're just going to see AMD just run away for the finish line forever, and Intel just kind of trailing as a, a second place. But also, x86 as an architecture, is kind of in a funny place at the moment in the market. Um, Microsoft are allegedly working on ARM processors. I mean, they kind of have a history with ARM anyway, but apparently they're really pushing a lot of development resources into ARM at the moment. And you can imagine what that could even mean with the next generation consoles. I've discussed that already in a previous video. Um, Obviously, NVIDIA are, well, buying ARM, and I've already had my exclusive that uh, NVIDIA want to release processors which essentially are going to be replacing x86. I mean, just, yeah, bottom line, all of this technology that we're seeing, it, there's a lot of competing technology, and I think that x86 has somewhat languished, to be honest, in kind of performance. Not to say that there weren't some improvements, but nowhere near as rapidly as perhaps they should have. And I do definitely blame Intel for this. You know what I mean. When we saw, for example, uh, Sandy Bridge to Ivy Bridge to Haswell, yes, I admit Skylake was a nice leap, but those architectural advancements, they were not like the big leaps forwards. And yes, you can blame Moore's Law and all of that stuff, but you know what? Um, I think at this point we're starting to finally see those innovations kind of really come to the fray. I'm really looking forward to seeing what Intel do bring to the table though with Rocket Lake. I'm actually hyped. I want competition. Um, and I think Rocket Lake has a really good chance of winning the gaming crown if nothing else. But yeah. With all of that said, thank you very much for watching the video. If you have enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe to the channel and uh, obviously ring the bell icon because YouTube. And I'm also going to plug for a moment. I put out a video a couple of days ago uh, where I was investigating, like, you know, magnifying glass and all. I was investigating a resizable bar on Intel's architecture using an RX 6800XC, and the results are actually really impressive for that. So definitely check that out if you've not already, and get subscribed for a lot more content. With all of that said, thank you very much for uh, watching the video. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.